Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and this is the October 29th Cloud 2030 discussion about venture capital. Um, really interesting because uh, we want to talk, we love talking about venture capital and how it's breaking everything, and we definitely did. And we also talked about where we think things are going. So it's a great talk. Stay tuned. Uh, once again, the whole thing. Great conversation. Enjoy. So here's our icebreaker of the day. Yay. Oh, good. I was hoping you had one. Okay. How do we justify valuation? Snowflake, Twilio, HashiCorp. $72 billion, $72 billion for Snowflake, Twilio, $40 billion, HashiCorp, $5 billion. Um, Pulumi just raised $37.5. And so how do we justify those valuations? What trends are they working off of? And then we can take that from companies that have achieved some level of market success and move that down into the startup world. Who, who is we? Andrea? We, <laughs> us, the royal we. Uh, Justify to whom? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> the, okay, people. Fine. The, the one VC on the call that needs the answer. <laughs> and, so oh. have you actually, has anyone actually looked at the numbers? I have looked at some, but walk us through, Lawrence. What I, I have, and that's I just want to know okay. is what's what's the the actual revenue and what's the comparisons. I don't know, so I can't. I didn't look at it. Well, so one of the things that I think is interesting is that there are some similarities between them, and that's what I was wondering. I was thinking about. They all have free tiers or beginning tiers which I think is interesting. They're all in um, huge markets. Um, can you name them again, Andrea? I'm sorry. I was just thinking, I mean, the ones that I read about often are Snowflake, which has a $72 billion valuation. Okay. Twilio is at 40 billion, HashiCorp at five. And so I was just thinking we could have a discussion about what are some similarities about these companies. How did they I think it'd be, open I think it'd be interesting to call out a few of the differences first. Yes, then, exactly. Okay. So if you look at Twilio, for example, Twilio has got a much longer history. Mm -hmm. So if one were to project their impact on the industry, their growth rates, you know, kind of the shadow that they cast going mm -hmm. forward. Um, and the fact that they have been so dominant in that part of the uh, that part of the business, they have you know they kind of invented that part of the you know kind of the API the API business the, mm -hmm. uh, for for services. I think that that has a little bit more of a justification in terms of their cap mm -hmm. their their market um snowflake that sounds like a lot of uh it's not like great offer it's a great product the technology is is really super mm -hmm. but that valuation just completely blows me away that mm -hmm. that sounds like irrational exuberant spike mm -hmm. you know by a, a, a number of folks who are underwriting it and trying to get it out there. <laughs> yeah. But as, as when I've when I've looked at the valuations over the years, I mean, going all the way back to when I was asked about the valuation for mm -hmm. um, a Amazon uh, in 1998 by financial mm -hmm. uh, investors that would call from Wall Street and say, "What's going on? Why isn't he just making money now? Why is he continuing to mm -hmm. invest more money, etc.?" Is that I, I I don't agree that. All of the value, all the valuations are appropriate um, because no matter what valuation you have, there's there are always risks to market change. So, but the difference today is that if you looked at if you looked at IBM in in 1920, mm -hmm. you could say the valuation would be worth 20 billion dollars in 1920 if you accounted for all the growth in population and the exponential growth in the demand for new machines mm -hmm. and compute by 1960. Mm -hmm. right? You could do that. The difference today is that you could take a software company 
and you could do what would take an IBM in 1920, 50 years to do, and you could do it in five years. The question is, will the market stay the same for five years? Will new competition be introduced during that five years that negates your benefit? Um, will your management be successful? Because there's no guarantee that just because you've got a good project product, your executive team will be successful. Mm -hmm. So the difference is that people are willing to bet on a notion because the time scale is so much shorter for mm -hmm. potential success that they're willing to bet on that higher valuation because they know if they don't, missing it by a year means everything. Mm -hmm. Well, and what's interesting about what Rich said is Twilio has been around there. They were founded in 2009. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're acting like they've been around forever and they're the winner and they've actually only been around for 11 years, which I think is right. really fascinating. And so the question but, becomes, they have super it, short- but 11 years, 11 years in this, in this industry, in this business, that's, that's, you know, that's mature. That's right. <laughs> Not quite mature like me mature, but you know, mature. Well, and oh, I wanted wait, are to you make sure yet? that Mark is here this week. <laughs> just I them just from this perspective. Yeah. No, <laughs> Look, I called him what? specifically yesterday because he's working on a startup. And so the topic today is startups, VC, investors, and we can take this anywhere we want to go. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we had Mark here because he is both starting a company and advising another early stage company, Tobit, who has participated here as well. So um, I'm, I've written down a number of questions, but we can really take this wherever we want to go. And there are certain things in that, um, like what trends get funded most easily. And I think Lawrence and I were just sort of talking about that a minute ago. Um, we can talk about are there go to markets with that we want to replicate for success. Um, the, another thing we can talk about is how do we decipher between hype and truth? And how do you communicate that? You know, oftentimes um, at RACN, we think that maybe HashiCorp gets too much praise or something. And so how do we, how do we, you know, justify our position? Um, what opportunities need to happen to make new startups flourish? What are our VCs looking for? And then topics like what's better for a corporate VC versus um, an independent VC? Um, Gina recently said, you know, oh, my whole world is about smart NICs right now. Are smart NICs something that are going to get funded outside of corporate VC? Um, so those are some topics that I was thinking about in advance of this call, and we can kind of take it anywhere if people would, might like it. Well, why don't you draw a distinction between corporate venture capital and kind of the, the institutional venture? Mm -hmm. So institutional you... venture, I think is super interesting because, so they go and raise a billion dollars and they make a hundred, or yeah, maybe a hundred bets, not, maybe not that many, but the truth is they want every single one of those to reach a multi-billion and if certain fail along the way, if there's collateral damage and they drive a couple to zero, that's fine. Um, which is not fine if you're owner operated because you're not going to drive your company to zero and you're not going to spend spend everything on open source and just get developers even if they don't pay because that's that's not an, a viable strategy. What I think is interesting about corporate VC is um, when it's done right, they should be investing for their product portfolio. Right, and so there is an alignment with their strategy. Also corporate VC, for instance, at Bitfusion, we found them to be significantly less price sensitive. And so we saw companies like Samsung and Xilinx doing like 20, taking notes, which are like 20% discount to the next round, where at, without knowing when the next round would be. And so we found them to be less price sensitive because they wanted to get involved in the technologies. And so when Gina yesterday said, everyone's talking about smart next, and I think about the trends that are getting funded in VC where everything is cloud, cloud, cloud. Um, and last week we were talking about moving from, op from CapEx to OpEx. I'm starting to think, well, 
smart nicks, then they must fall into the category of what will be interesting to a corporate VC. Those are just some thoughts that I had. Um, corporate VCs themselves, in my experience, <clears throat> will range from we only invest in mm -hmm. companies that are, you know, making revenue series B or further along. Mm -hmm. We're looking for every one of the, our investments to be closely tied to an initiative in, in the yeah. company. Yeah. That, but that's not always the case. There are some corporate VCs who have much broader spectrum. They're willing to mm -hmm investigate and put money into mm -hmm. emerging areas in order to stay close to it, to have mm -hmm. their name associated with it, to be um, hip, mm -hmm. you know, for want of a better word. Yeah, and I totally agree with you, but the thing that's also interesting is that like, if you look at like Intel Capital or something and you guys, um, and like, they decide that they're going to do that and the minute they become less profitable like they are right now like the whole, the whole concept of corporate vc gets uh, i think there are a lot of institutional vcs who are just as just as clear about you know taking a company investing in it early on and then you know leaving it to hang out to dry i mean mm -hmm. um there are some big names in silicon valley who were notorious for kind of spending big time on a on a startup companies and then losing interest and just not re not fought, not participating in the follow on mm -hmm. the result being everybody else said oh why is mm -hmm. all right I'll name a name why is kp not re not re upping mm -hmm. It must be something wrong with the company or something dark, we don't know. Yeah. And it's for no other reason than, you know, the, the, the organization itself has said, you know, not as interested in that area anymore or not, you know, and, and the, mm -hmm. the result is that the, the yeah. company itself can get, get seriously I, damaged by it. Yeah. I, I actually have a, follow-up question for you on that, Rich, because you're you're making me think about the Silicon Valley model, which I think has been widely adopted, is build a company enough to get it flipped and absorbed into a, into a larger company, um, which, which has been, and, and I think that part of the corporate strategy is like, hey, you know, you took money from Big Corp X, they're either acquiring you in 18 months or you're flipping to, you know, uh, neutral party in, in 18 months. It's they're, they're with some of the exceptions that Andrea has on the table are actually companies that have navigated that path and are operating, continuing to operate. Um, and in some cases, the, the valuation keeps them from being acquisition targets. Uh, Hashi is a good example to me, right? Hashi made, seems like they made a decision, getting to my question in a second, I promise, made a decision to pump pump their value to towards a IPO track, not towards an acquisition track. And it's it's amazing to me that they actually had to make a decision like that relatively early in their thing. Docker did the same thing and it was a huge mistake for the Docker Docker teams. Um, right. But are we creating an environment explain? where- I don't understand what you mean. Um, Docker, let me do Docker because it was such a well-documented case. Uh, Docker was this tiny, was a, was a pivot that became right became a new company with a new product, and there was a huge rush towards Docker, tremendous enthusiasm, and and everybody started saying, well, who is going to acquire Docker? Is it going to go to Red Hat? Is it going to go to Microsoft? Is it going to go to wherever? And they took on this huge amount of money, created like a ten billion dollar valuation or hundred billion dollar valuation, all paper, um, to prevent them from being. I think they took money from Microsoft even like to prevent them from being acquired quickly in this model. Like they, they leapt up in valuation stack so that they didn't get acquired by, by Google one, one first. Thing. Actually, I mean, I mean, let's, let's stop, let's by stop calling, right? let's, let's stop calling these building a company. If your job is to get acquired, <laughs> you are not building a company. 
You are in the minor leagues for the pros, right? You're the tri- you're triple A using baseball terminology, <laughs> and you are a feeder to somebody else's business. You are not building a company like so, that. My, well, you're you're making me think of Bill, Bill Durham, right? That's yeah. the Bill did, Durham did, scenario. Did, did I, was IBM built to flip? No. Was no. SAP built to flip? GE? I mean, no, they're not. Like that That model is not a company building model. It is no, a not. feeder system for other people to I, build companies on. But I'll ask the proverbial question that I always ask, and those of you that have heard me talk about these things for long enough or tired of hearing it, but I'll ask the question, why is that the case? And so in order to answer that question, you have to come back to the motivations. If you look at the motivations of venture capital firms, it's not to build a company, right? They are beholden to their stakeholders. Their stakeholders are the investors. And so at the end of the day, they're first and foremost, and then there are secondary and tertiary um, components to that, but first and foremost, they're looking to provide a significant return as quickly as possible because then that then feeds the whole VC model for the next fund and the next fund and the, and the next fund. But what they're creating is in terms of value for the customer is a feature, not a product, right? Mm-hmm. Not a product that has a company that can kind of survive on its own, you know, in, into the future. And so that's one of the distinguishing pieces I'd suggest is that you have those that are focused on building features and those that are focused on building companies. And those are two different, but you have to understand the reasons why. Mm -hmm. It's the, in in many cases, it's the, it's the intellectual property that's valued, not the the product that the company creates. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask. Klaus, uh, just to follow that question. What examples are you giving, do you have in mind when you talk about the intellectual property as opposed to somebody who builds a feature or let's call it a product as opposed to a company and gets market share, has revenue, so forth. What is the intellectual property you're referring to by example? Um, I mean, take a look at IBM, Red Hat. They the Look at the, what they acquire and what they do with the acquisitions. That they, they acquire the IP portfolio, to the, the the patents basically, because they can monetize those pat- patents. Um, I I mean, a previous company I, I worked at, uh, which was in the AI market before it, it, it exploded, um, the market, not, not the company. Um, again, like their 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 major valuation. From the investor, the investor side, was their patent portfolio. It was not the product that they were they were creating. The product was to showcase the patents, not to actually make money of them. Yeah, I I would agree that IP and patent portfolios are are a, a, an element, but that is all. Those have become actually, you know. They basically weaponized IP. You you buy patent portfolios either for offense or for defense in your competitive in your competition. In my mind, what VCs do, and this is to Tim's point, they're in the business of watching the early stages of technology. They're at the they're at the forefront, and it's make money return money to the limited partners. The, the point that Tim made was as rapidly as possible. It actually isn't as rapidly as possible. If you look at the return, the length of time on returns out of venture capital, it's, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that your return is gonna be a, a seven to eight year return time. You're, more likely to make money faster in this environment if you go into a, if you have the money to participate in a, a, a PE who's doing more mature companies, putting them together, trying to make them uh, very efficient. And then to same thing, it's the flip model. I'm creating a new company, squeezing out all of the 
um, kind of the redundancy in it, and then making something that has a either dominance in the market or something that I can sell. Turnaround time for an investment out of PE is closer to four to five years, not six, not seven, eight. Those are fantastic stats, Rich. Well, I was going to go back to one of your very early points, which is about like Kleiner Perkins. And one of the things that I've learned recently that I think is super interesting is so, you know, they go through funds every couple of years. And so if you invest in a company at fund one at a super low valuation, and now you're at fund two, fund two with the different set of LPs doesn't want to invest in that same company at a higher valuation because it's harder to make a return. So sure. Kleiner Perkins theoretically would say, no, thank you. We don't want to invest because we're in a different fund now. And it's a black eye for the company, and really, they've done well. <laughs> yeah, no, it, there's it's a real, there's a real, there's, there's a real art to figuring out the timing that you're coming in on with a fund. If you're at the end of a fund, one of the things you have to count on is: Do I depend on this investor for follow-on investment? If I do a little queasier about it than if I'm um, a company that, sure, they're coming in, they're in a syndicate. If they don't, if they're not the lead, they're not the, you know, the Hollywood marquee name on the, on the investment group. If they don't, if they just take their pro rata and, and do nothing very dramatic, that's okay with me. But your point is absolutely well taken trying to invest in the same portfolio company across funds. VCs definitely don't like doing it because their LPs don't like doing it and it causes interior problems. That was something that I've just recently kind of learned about. The other thing that I think that we've learned about at Rackan is, you know, VCs are reading you know, very high level research about like cloud trends. And so it's how do you position yourself if you're slightly less typical? If your VC is less typical, is that no, what you're if asking? your company is wanting to pursue VC, but you don't, when you read the research and Gartner says 70% of all companies are moving to the cloud and you have something that requires a little bit of thought, of thought, how do you position yourself and your company when you're not following the trend? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think like almost anything, you just have to have a really good story is the first thing, right? And a, a really good story, it's funny that Rich and I were just talking about this earlier, but being able to tell a really good story is important, but also having a really good finger on the pulse of why do you think that, um, your outlying position is aligned with something that's likely to happen in the industry, right? I mean, there are many people on the call right now who would probably argue um, uh, uh, in both directions of it's all gonna be cloud or it's gonna meet some balance at some point of 60, 40 or 70, 30, or uh, the availability of edge will impact ownership of infrastructure or distribution of influence on infrastructure ownership, or um, low code, no code will mean not that um, everything will be a SaaS product, but in fact, there will be an explosion of new applications by individuals within companies or organizations within companies. How will that impact uh, the growth of technology supply going forward? Um, and, and, the working through any one of those topics I just mentioned is the hard part. How do you tie that to the other parts of the industry and say, so, okay, somebody could argue with me, okay, low code, no code. You might be right, Mark, but why would I develop that on my own infrastructure? Why wouldn't I just put that out on, on Amazon, right? Yeah. And, and I'd be like, uh, so you have to have good answers for that kind of thing. The hard part for any of us and, you know, um, Rob and I have had this discussion a dozen times if we've had it once, and that's the worst, worst spot for a startup to be in is it doesn't matter how right your product is if you have to educate the customer yep. on why they need it, right? And Speaking of no-code, no-code, I've been dying to get educated on it. 
I think uh, we're uh, having a uh, DevOps. The DevOps lunch is going to talk about. Uh, this. Oh, good. I'll be there. Nice. It's a coming session. So. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly um, right, though. If you have to educate, you're wasting your time. Well, if you have to, if you have to educate your investor, mm -hmm. you're also in a you're also in a, a, a difficult position. Yeah. Um, I don't know about most of the people on that have had this, but I mean, I've been dealing with early stage companies and taking them to to venture capital for a long time, different kinds of investment not just venture capital. And there are a few VCs that are very methodical. They have a thesis, they have a, an approach to things and they stick with it. And they tend to be very good performers. They, they will, the, the, the ones that do a good job of it, they tend to be a little bit on the smaller side and focused. There are a lot of VCs that are absolutely flavor of the kind of flavor of the month or flavor of the year. It's like I remember Je listening to Jeffrey Moore one time, and he was talking about VCs looking like a bunch of antelopes on the on the, uh, uh, and all of a sudden they'll be sitting there grazing. All of a sudden, one will raise its head, and for no discernible reason. Go off in a in a you know dead run in one direction. Every every one of the other antelopes lifts their head, follows right along. Don't know why they're just going in that direction. It's close. Um, they they operate on sometimes some pretty thin thin value propositions and tend to kind of follow trends. Um, I think. One of the things you have to assume is that if you're a, uh, to your question, Andre, if you're a, if you are a technology company early stage, and you can't point to an enormous uptake on the product or the service yet, um, you have to find a partner in a firm that actually gets it, understands it, and you know, kind of embraces it. It's a, it's um, it's a, it, these are relationships. These are not, you know, it's not like walking into the Wells Fargo and, and opening a checking account. So how, how does this, how does this change over, over time? Because right, this is, I think part of what we always want to do is pull this into we have a VC model and it's actually been adapting like as it gets better about, um, uh, I don't wanna ask, I mean, there's there's an element to, I'm interested in, in thinking about how much it's changed since 99 when like people would, would IPO on, um, <laughs> I think food should come in a bag instead of a can. Um, but what what could shake i mean cloud could shake things up i think it's already priced in into i can build a platform without buying any infrastructure i don't need to do all that work i just need the idea and the people so people are still the the key constraint i haven't seen globalization dramatically change that although i, I know there, there are some startups that'll that'll hire a team of 20 offshore developers for the cost of one u.s developer and and crank through a whole bunch of stuff is there something that that's going to really move the needle, like change the way VCs invest? Right, crowdsourcing. I don't feel like crowdsourced investment from a company formation perspective has has materialized. Um, it does the like for little that, consumer um, products, but the one thing yeah. that comes to mind, Rob, with cloud is the ability to get to MVP so quickly, a really quick beta, something rough to start getting feedback. That comes to mind. Uh, faster. I mean, MV, but are there, are there examples of company? I mean, like in a way, HashiCorp has done a ton of MVPs and built a company out of it. Um, Look at Slack. Slack. Yeah. So Slack wasn't even their original product, right? That's a classic was, pivot. Yeah, that was a pivot, but they were able to do it rather rapidly. And, and they used, they, they basically took 
tooling that they had built for themselves and turned that into the into the offer. They were able to do it. They had, um, you know, they had a lot of luck, but the timing was absolutely right. And you know, they they attended to a couple of the aspects that were, you know resonating with their the the community that was willing to buy that was interested in buying there's nothing about what slack offers functionally that hasn't been around in some form for actually decades yeah. but the way they've packaged it the way they've you know put it in place you know and they've they they've been smart about the pricing model they've been smart about the way in which they get, allow others to use it as a as a conduit to the customer you know there yeah i was going to say there's a lot of case studies now about how they got into the enterprise I, yeah. I would like to also bring in you know what tim said right the mvp is almost like a feature so you know and then like what mike said earlier is you're, you're building these features and your goal is to be acquired to become someone else's revenue stream. It, what, you know, what happens, I, I remember in 2014, actually no, 2012, meeting with companies in the UK and when their thing was, you know, okay, it, it's like fashion, things out of Silicon Valley are like fashion. If they don't last one, one or two seasons, we don't want to buy it. We don't want to invest in training our people to use that technology because it'll get acquired by somebody and we don't know if we'll like the terms, et cetera, et cetera. So they tend to wait at least one or two seasons before even they even now they still do they still do that. What do we think of that kind of is it pragmatic or is it not? Well, especially if you know, like we've all said, it's features. Well, I, and to be clear, it's a balance, right? It's it's not where it's just a unique feature, but I, I use that example as the extreme, but it's more of a feature than a platform. You know, a platform is harder to sell because the, you run into cultural issues, you run into integration issues, architectural issues, but a feature is much easier, again, just using extremes to make the point, a feature is much easier to sell because it's much easier to integrate and therefore derive value from so with lower the, risk. So I agree with what was just said, but to, to kind of up level the conversation a little bit more around the, the VC thing and the impact there is, um, you know, as the old saying go in a couple with a couple that gets divorced is that it takes two to tango. And um, a lot of what we're talking about uh, could easily be argued um, is the actual startup incentive um, issues as far as what the startup founders are looking to accomplish rather than just what the VCs are looking to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in many cases. It's, it's also true. So I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't know how much of that statement is true other than that I believe that there is something to it. But if you think about um, you know, a feature build or, a, or, a, or a, a, a revenue build versus the build, that's not necessarily always a bad thing. I mean, there's been a lot of success from companies like Cisco where somebody had a great idea and they went out and did a startup because that was a more flexible option for, for thing and innovation. And, and then they get just get bought by Cisco and come right back in again. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for uh, industry growth, but I do believe that we have a non-virtuous cycle in, um, in how we incent um, VCs when they invest and how we incent um, people to actually start businesses. I mean, I think, you know, even going back to education, when you get people like Peter Thiel saying, oh no, just give your kid $100,000 and uh, they don't even need to go to college and, you know, have them start a business. Um, it sounds great when, when you're, a billion dollar baby. And if you go spend $500,000 and some dumb angel investors, $200,000 and end up with nothing. Oh, well, he learned or she learned and now she'll be a better employee or she'll start a better company. That's great for 1% of the population. 
but what about everyone else? And so we, we really have some, some incentive problems uh, in our industry and, and finding the right way to, to um, counteract them. I, I don't have any uh, obvious answers, but finding a way to counteract them is, is critical. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm frankly, you know, Rich and I talk about this on an almost daily basis, but I'm terrified uh, I need to raise money I am terrified about what raising that money will mean to my incentives. I'm terrified of, of uh, even what could happen 10 years from now if I was a public company and I'm, and I'm being incented by how to report on a quarterly basis. I hate that shit. I think it's the worst freaking uh, uh, um, uh, measure uh, that the Western world has ever created is this quarterly measure. I've had, I've had CFOs turn down opportunities to save money because it would have cost a little bit of money and shaved half a penny off next quarter's announcement. You know, it's just our incentive model today for how businesses are built, how they're invested in and how they're reaped. Mm -hmm. The the reaping part, especially is, is, is really broken. I think your your line, your, your phrase, Mark, uh, early on non-virtuous. Yeah. Something for, I think everybody, everybody to remember that is such a good line. Um, cause it's, cause it is, it's accurate and you, and you, and you, you spell it out well, which is you feel it. And, and this is a part of the larger discussion, right? Is you feel like you are going to be forced to make those ethical, personal and professional ethical decisions in order to survive. Right now I'd argue, I'd argue back that they are binary decisions because they're are companies that have survived that have done well independently and maybe that power or that that trend is shifting back away from the away from the vc ethical uh you know non-virtuous side that you said or the quarterly or the quarterly earnings i mean only take a look at ibm for as an example right um you know they live and die by quarterly earnings mike well mike are you thinking of any companies, I mean, that you could kind of hold out there, maybe not, you know, complete paragons, but someone who's kind of taken a, a different path toward it and, and it's kind of maintained, let's call it integrity. Yeah. I mean, I, so there are a couple. So the, the person that i the person that I follow really heavily on that is this guy, Dan Price um, on Twitter, who's, he's famous for the, you know, knocking everybody to 70 K and then him taking zero. Yeah. Uh, he's got, he's got some great outlooks on this. He's pretty rational about it. Uh, despite how crazy that sounds. Um, uh, I look at, I mean, right on this call, you look at somebody like Rob, uh, who is, who has been doing that. I personally get to see it with Linode. Um, and it, it's not, so it's not apples to apples though. Right. So right. Linode, Linode's probably, you know, to me is probably the best example of this. Been around for 17 years doing doing cloud hosting, never had any intentions to compete against an AWS or anybody else, still doesn't, right? It's a hundred, and it's gone from 30, you know, it's gone from um, a couple of websites in a Nashville hotel room to a hundred million dollar company serving about a million developers right now. And I don't say that as, you know, to, to market it, I say you can do it, right? But you have to stay true to who you are and you have to accept we are not going to scale or we are not going to, um, you know, we're not going to compromise our virtues. Uh, I still love that line, uh, Mark, uh, to just, you know, to, to, to hit, to hit, fake scale, right? If Linode hits, I don't know, let's call it, they get 0.1% of the market, 0.01% of the market. That's a lot. That's a, that's a good year for them. Right. And they can do, and you can do stuff that is not compromising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're probably, and they're probably, I mean, I'm sure there are more, there are more out there and I'm, and I'm sure there are more outside of tech, right? So when we all talk about you know, startups and small businesses, most of the world is not Silicon Valley startups. Most of the small businesses and startups that we talk about are mom and pop shops all over the place that are, you know, in small towns that are not 
looking to scale. They're not looking to become Starbucks. They're looking to say, I want to employ five people in my store and let them have a good life. Right. So Mike. Yep. Um, uh, I think it's a great point and I agree. And, and I would point to Rob as well. Um, uh, you know, he, he pisses me off because he's um, <laughs> such a good guy. Um, and, but, you know, if I think about Linode, um, and I agree, Linode has a decent product and they've got a decent market segment and all that kind of stuff. So how much of, of what I'm about to say is true? And I'd love to get feedback from, you know, everyone on the call. One is that, you know, that the vast majority of industry, I would bet not having had this call, mm -hmm. if any one of us were to walk down the street and talk to other tech people that happen to know the name Linode, they would say, God, those guys are almost invisible. I never hear about them. So how much of what we do these days is the problem of rock stardom versus rock solid company, mm -hmm. right? And, and our assumption of Linode's success, and I'm using the royal we here, not necessarily saying I believe this, but our assumption of Linode's success is that we can't walk down the road without kicking another Twitter um, uh, uh, output about great things that Linode's done or the money they've just raised or um, somebody else who's partnered with them. And I mean, I, I'm no, I'm no um, exception to that. I'm trying to do the same thing to gain visibility for my business. Mm -hmm. but, you know, where, where does the, the rock stardom that, that seems to be associated with um, quote unquote, the Silicon Valley company where does that come into play versus um, what you just suggested, um, which is just trying to build a good old solid company, whether it's going to be 50 million, 100 million or, or 200 million or not? I like to believe that's the voice of the customer. I like to believe your happy customers will go on Twitter and say that. But right. that be, uh, what I was that, that, that company that was founded by the Cisco people got a whole bunch of press and they didn't even have right. They formed and they were getting a whole bunch of press for forming. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can get, I can give you, I can give you the, the example. And, and Rob, I know you, I know your, your experience is, pre, is pretty similar to this. Linode went 15 years and didn't do any marketing. None. I mean, yeah. only in the, only in the last two years, because, you know, gr you know, growth, growth was, you know, there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of opportunity out there. Um, mm -hmm. You can do it, but you just you just nailed it, Mark. You gave a progression of 10 million, 20 million, 200 million. How much is enough? Right? What is what is it that your company's goals are? And I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to use the word lifestyle business, but there's a probably a corporate level of lifestyle business that play that plays into this to where I don't have to dominate the, you know, I don't have to dominate and compete against AWS on this. I can employ 250, 300 people and do really, really well for them, for their families, for their community. Um, you know, when we, when you look at that, you know, when you even look at the hyperscalers, there's really only two. We keep, everybody keeps saying that there are three, but if we're talking about scale and, and competition, it's Microsoft and Amazon. Like they're the only two at that level. When you look, when you look at the numbers. Yeah, and, I, you know, I, just, I love, I love the Google I, stuff. I agree with all that, Mike. And I, I guess maybe I'm just too weak as a human. I mean, on the one hand, uh, in building Edvana, we certainly talk about building new revenue streams, but we don't talk about them in the sense that we have to own the world. We just talk about them because it just turns out that building on the platform that we're designing creates a lot of new revenue opportunities um, that, that, that happened to accidentally fall on top of that community that we're building. But if, if I was Linode, um, I would, I might be happy with, you know, making hundred million or 200 million. In fact, I'm certain I'd be happy with making $200 million. That's not a question. What I would be nervous about every single time I went to bed though, is what would happen to me if I don't do one more thing? If I don't do one more thing to cement my differentiation, if I don't do one more thing to grow my customer base, will somebody like an Amazon, like a Microsoft, like a Google, just solve the problem that I'm attempting to solve for and crush me overnight? Well, that's but you just hit you just hit on it. What are your different what are your differentiators? And what is and your differentiators don't have to be parallel to what 
some of your other, some of your larger competitors are doing. So it doesn't have to be parity for parity. So 451, um, Jay Lyman at 451 has carved this out as sort of the alternative cloud uh, market. And there are, and Edgevana probably be the same in just about anybody, right? If you, if you take this, you know, there are big players, small players, thin, thin slice in the middle that has a, that has all of the core things that 80% of the customer base is going to, to need, regardless of what, whether we're talking cloud or coffee shops, right? 80% of the things that people are going to need. And then you compete um, and you differentiate on things that your larger competitors can't. So in the case of a Linode, they've got, you know, they're running on AMD and NVIDIA, all the same hardware. Um, they can, we can do it at, um, you know, at, at better price performance just because of the, just because of the size that we're at. But that's not the, that's not the comp, that's not the competitive differentiator. It's things like support, right? Which an Amazon, um, you know, can't, can't do, right? It's got to be, you know, Linode can put a hundred, you know, 150 people at their support so that you've got, um, you know, full time, you know, full time, 24 by seven phone based support. Those become your differentiators mm -hmm. uh, is are things where a larger competitor might not be able to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I would think that it's not Mike and, I, and I'm not trying to, to doubt you. I mean, you, you probably have a better idea of this than I do, but I would be thinking more along the lines of, um, the unique qualities and um, requirement for me to do something different at my scale mean that the revenue of another $250 million to $400 million, if I continued to grow it over five years, mm -hmm. isn't worth my time and effort as a $50 billion a year company. Right. But, but hold, hold on a second, because we're looking at a cycle that we've seen repeated over and over again in, in the in the history from a capitalism and size of company perspective. Mm -hmm. The current incentives are very strongly aligned to massive companies, right? Uh, you know, regulatory, financial, corporate earnings. The the incentives are are aligned towards basically growth at all costs. What we were talking about this negative cycle. They're they're and they're not aligned to uh, small companies and risks, right? What was um, uh, SK? Um, blah. I was. Um, why am I blanking on his name? Who, Eric? Somebody, Eric was just tweeting. He's like, if you want to make money, don't go do a startup. Go work for Amazon. Yeah. Right. And and one hundred percent, he's right. You're going to make a lot more money, both in stock value and in salaries. And and right now our incentive systems. And it, this could change overnight, mm -hmm. right? From a regulatory environment, you know, the government could come in and actually say, hey, we're, these, these companies are too big and too powerful. We need to break them up and, you know, not have a, a you know, a entity that has this much control over, you know, aspects of our economy or our media structures or things like that. Um, one of the things that I think that empowers that and, and as a startup, uh, founder, one of the hardest things for me is there's no safety net for my employees. Mm -hmm. The thing that keeps me up is actually, right, I want to grow revenue. I want my product to be used by everybody, you know, uh, and, and see that as a success. And we're going to make people pay for it because that's a validation that it has value. But the thing that keeps me up is making a mistake and having people, you know, no, no salary, right? No, no health insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in tech, in tech, that's maybe not so much of a risk, but you know, it is still. So if you hire somebody and you make a bad bet and you have, have as a startup down times, I've had that, you know, you've got people that all of a sudden you can't pay their insurance, you can't pay their salaries. Mm -hmm. um, and startups, most of them aren't just meat markets. They, they are very, very diligent on how, on the, the people who are part of that, you mm -hmm. know, building that company with them. Both their customers and their their things. I think that's what you know. Linode has has been about relationships with its customers and service and things like that. Um, I don't know. I, I I think that we could see if things keep going the way they're going. I love the two thousand the twenty thirty thought. Things keep going the way they're going. We're only going to end up with 
four companies controlling everything, right? There's sci-fi scenarios of, of yeah. that. I um, highly yeah. recommend highly recommend folks read one of the books that um, that I've picked up that I've been reading. It's big as anything. It's like Stephen King it level. Um, it's uh, the Bully Pulpit by Doris Kearns Goodwin or Doris Goodwin Kearns. I never figure out which or what are those are supposed to go in, uh, but it's about um, uh, the rise of Roosevelt and Taft, mm. and uh, it's really about journalism. But you look at it go it we're in we're in a very similar point in history as that time i mean the there you could swap out mad lib style different um names mm -hmm. for some of the politicians and some of the companies and the players in there and it is directly parallel like history is absolutely repeating itself um and you know going back to what to what we were just talking about a little you know we're seeing a little we're seeing pushback Right. And I think Rob's right. Right. We, we run the risk. And that's why all the larger competition, the larger conversations down in D.C. are happening right now is, you know, around around antitrust is they've gotten big and we are seeing pushback um, from that uh, at Linode. Right. People are looking for different choices, different alternatives, mm -hmm. not just from, you know, from the technology side, but they're still worried about Amazon's breadth and whether they are compete, you know, whether they, you know, they're going to compete with them. So we see that not at an, not necessarily at the large enterprise level, but you see it with, with that, with small businesses, because like Mark says, they're scared shitless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I, you know, uh, I, of course, Rob and I have had a lot of conversations about the, um, the monopolized mm -hmm. nature of, of many of our businesses. And then, um, you know, we also talked about, um, the, the benefit that the large corporation or those with lots of money have. And, and one, of the, one of the issues that we don't have time to talk about today, but um, uh, is an interesting topic is, is the notion that the more money you have and the more income you have, the easier and cheaper it is to get more money, um, which is just the opposite end of the spectrum. It's kind of like the person who has $10,000 to put into a bank and the bank gives them a free TV for putting it in. And if I had fucking ten thousand dollars, I could put into the bank. I don't need the goddamn bank to give me a three hundred dollar TV. <laughs> the guy that has three hundred dollars to put in the bank actually needs the TV. Yeah. Um, right. And so right now, though, yeah. I mean that's what you're advocating. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, but um, anyway, I you know I um, uh, I uh, am uh, deeply worried about um, uh, the comments uh, relative to the monopolies. Uh, I mean, I'm actually. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether I was one of the first or not, but like four or five years ago, I, um, I talked in maybe with a couple of the people on this call right now about the notion of um, becoming um, corporate states in the future. Oh, what? Corporate states. If you, if you think about the power of a, of a Google or a Microsoft and you think about the lack of... of um, of separation between where money comes from and how our government is run, mm -hmm. um, it's not far fetched to think that we could become corporate states. Oh, it's not going to happen. I understand why you, why you're saying it, but it's not going to happen. It wasn't um, going to happen to have somebody that we have in office today have to do what they do with the government either. So, um, uh, you know, I just I'm Mark just saying. Just I think what Mark just sort of indicated though, you know, it, there are times when your business is doing well and you can get the lines of credit organized even though you don't need it now. And there are times when you can raise money even though you don't need it now. There's, um, you know, that's the best time to do it, right? right. <laughs> Yep. When you that's, don't need it, a, when you raise it. Yep. That's yeah. Right. It's when you don't need it. Yeah. But that's, and, but that's how you beat it. And that's when the investor wants to give it to you, by the way. And that's when like, the investor, yeah. When everything's going fabulous. Oh, I'll come in. Yeah. yeah but that's <laughs> well, was the problem with what happened to going starting from the beginning. That's what happened with Docker. They cut the money when they could. And it, but they didn't use it wisely. Mm -hmm. they, there was nothing wrong with collecting the, the money. Well, they didn't they have it. They didn't have a they didn't have a plan that closed. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, basically what happened. And I also think that there is very. I mean, we've talked about all these companies with these huge amounts of money. I really believe that too much money is not helpful. 
I mean, it's oh, a good problem well, to have. This is, but there's a difference between valuation and money, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. I and, mean, from that that perspective, some companies take on huge amounts of cash, or create huge valuations. And and, and also, there's a there's been a kind of ignoring a, a very fundamental point. Yes, to the point that was made earlier about cloud, it makes it for a class of service, class of offering, makes it very inexpensive and very fast to try something to, to uh, you know, do turns on the, on the product and, and you can be very, very agile. Mm -hmm. But there are very, very important businesses that require more time, more infrastructure, more attention to kind of building the underpinnings and the foundations, which you don't need if you've got no code, low code, you know, applications that you can turn, mm -hmm. turn out, you know, very quickly for um, um, a consumer, mm -hmm. a consumer audience. If we paint every business, which is what some VCs do, will mm -hmm. say, well, you know, I've invested in the last 20 companies and they all turned it out quickly. Um, the reason they did was because what they're investing in is, you know, fast to market. It's fast to grow. It's fast to change. These things have different underpinnings. They have different genetics. They have different architectures. Mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot um, about, you know, sometimes there are DOD funds and Cibber and those type of things as well. Um, yeah, we actually haven't talked much about the the role of of government and and public dollars public it's sector in dollars. our industry, and I think that's quite important, not just from a regulatory point of view, but from a you know a consumer, you know, government mm -hmm. as a consumer of cloud, big time. This is what the next decade is going to have in spades particularly as a result of COVID. Rich, yeah. and two, two things about this. Mm -hmm. One is I just, a uh, month ago, I read, read a report about IoT usage. It's not going to cloud, but IoT. It was all about um, what, what federal agencies were using as guidelines for buying IoT procurement. So same sort of thing. It's like they're thinking about it the whole entire beltway uh, industries thinking about how they're going to be selling th that. So you're right on. Class, uh, um, in the last number of years, whatever the cloud, the federal government's the biggest buyer of, of, of tech. So yes, one. Number two is in a broader scale, my, my own public policy, um, high horse, I don't really, I'm not as I don't care as much about antitrust as some other people, but what I do care about is that intellectual property that's invested mm -hmm. in public monies get, is available for free. So all the in, money that's going to, into, going to universities for research gets, re, gets it's publicly available and that all that gets in whatever way that happens. Yeah. Well, that, would, that would that would be better open source than the corporate open source in my opinion all well, right but I, I will just say the um the spend the level of spend on cloud on public cloud service providers mm -hmm. and infrastructure applications the, the whole layer cake by local governments um k through 12 kind of school districts mm -hmm. counties states is going to be explosive in particular as a result of what we've just gone mm -hmm. through in the course of the last year and the innovation in this industry in cloud 2030 some of them will continue to be technical and, and technological and, and advances on that kind of functionality. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I put the, the stake in the ground here 
that some of the most innovative aspects of cloud in the next decade are going to be business models, economics, things like true financial operations, how to, how to maximize, how to optimize, how to govern mm -hmm. use of cloud services by the public sector, by that public sector clientele. And yeah. those are going to be businesses and they, and that do okay. that well, are gonna do well. That's cool. Yeah, and we'll be enabled by some of those funds, startups. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, I, absolutely. I, I, maybe, uh, I do, <laughs> I, maybe just, I mean, I, I, I monitor the state CIO, CIO uh, associations and things like that. I'll go back and look a little bit more about that. I'll um, give you a good example offline. Thank you, guys. Okay. There you go. We'll keep it going. We'll keep yes. continuing What's in the next, next in a week. What's next week? Uh, there was something big next week. Let me see. Something big. Uh, edge. Oh, that'll be fun. Bye, guys. Oh, yes. Bye-bye. Oh, yes. Bye.